Hello, my name is Becky Buxton. I teach microbiology in the medical laboratory science program at the University of Utah in the western part of the United States. I'm a big fan of the microbe library and I hope that you will be too in about half an hour. This is the United States and the red arrow is pointing at Utah. That's where I am. At the conclusion of this presentation, I hope that you, the participant, will be able to locate and navigate the Microbe Library website and find the ASM curriculum guidelines. I hope that you can describe the contents of the four Microbe Library collection and explain some novel uses of the images and animations. I hope you seek to use Bloom's taxonomy and other resources to construct valuable assessment questions and I hope you'll consider contributing to the microbe library. Also, I hope you'll explore other ASM resources and activities. So I will introduce several of the ASM resources, but we will spend most of our time on the microbe library. Um, many of you already know, but this is where you'll find it, www.microbelibrary.org. On the new home page, you'll see that there are four different collections called Gallery, Visual Media Briefs, Laboratory Protocols, and Student Learning Assessments. We will go through some examples and uses for each of them. But before we go any farther, I need to highlight the ASM's curriculum guidelines. You can find them linked in several places, but one of the easiest to locate is from the ASM's homepage under Microbiology for the Public. All of the future microbe library resources will be referenced to these guidelines, and I think that you will find them quite helpful. There's a lot of detail on this page, and I think you will find the subcategories in the small print, so on this page there down here, these are the subcategories. I think you'll find them helpful, but for now, Let's just look at the major category headings for the uh, guidelines. The first part deals with concepts and statements. Like I said before, there are subcategories under each of these items, but I really appreciate the broad and open nature of the guidelines. An effort was made to distill the very basics of an introductory microbiology class. Depending on whether you teach biology majors or pre-allied health students or some other group, you may emphasize one area over another, but you will touch on all of these things. It's great to have resources that help you fill out your curriculum in the areas that are important to you. The second section deals with the skills and competencies. Again, these are very broad categories that can be adjusted to meet the needs of your classroom. The microbe library can now be searched based on each of these topics. Now a look at the library collections, beginning with the gallery. This is probably the simplest of the collections. As you can see, it includes a variety of resources, but at this time it's primarily images. And it makes more sense if we look at the page. Notice that the gallery contents, gallery contents up here, um, include resources associated with laboratory protocols, and then also extremophiles, human infectious diseases, and veterinary infectious diseases. And then within the laboratory protocols, there's a considerable list of options. <clears throat> These are primarily images used to illustrate the laboratory protocols. We will take a look at the blood auger collection <coughs> to start with. You will see thumbnails of images with a brief legend. There are several pages of blood auger images. This one, is, this particular one is uh, streptococci. So um, my favorite image on this page is one that I've used quite often. The legend is shown on the main gallery page. This is just clipped out bigger from there. Um, and the user can then select an image off of that page that they wish to download or examine further. So we can click on the enlarged view and the image appears. Um, this image will uh, il illustrates the difference between alpha and beta hemolysis, alpha and beta, um, and also introduces the student to the idea of normal upper respiratory flora 
in the presence of a potential pathogen. My students see it in several different lectures, but it is also an image that I use in my own special way for some recruiting exercises that I do in high schools and also in classes that don't include laboratory sections. I have discovered that if you take three round images, such as these petri dishes, and space them evenly on a standard PowerPoint field, and then print them out by 8.5 by 11 inch paper, the circles come out to be just about 100 millimeters in diameter. If you then put them on overhead transparency film, this stuff, <laughs> overhead transparency film, it's, it's transparent, it's, it's the size of a piece of paper, but you can see through it, and then cut them out. Take your scissors and cut the, the images off of the transparency film, cut them out of the transparency film, and then paste them into um, 100 millimeter plastic petri dishes. So plain, clear, plastic, 100 millimeter petri dishes. Take the images that you just cut out and then paste them in the bottom of the plate. That's not agar in there, that's just the picture pasted in the bottom of the plate. Then, when the student holds these plates up to the light, <laughs> they can visualize and understand hemolysis in the classroom without having to be exposed to live organisms. That's one of my favorite tricks. Further down on the page of gallery contents, you'll find the human infectious diseases. Um, because I teach primarily medical laboratory science students, I find this area especially useful. The bulk of the images currently in this collection um, originated from a publication that was donated by Dr. Fred Tenover and previously distributed by Upjohn Laboratories, but Microbe Library is always seeking additional clinical images. They don't have to have been published in this resource um, previously to be accepted for um, further additions to the gallery. Again, you see the gallery format with a short legend for each image, and then a link to a larger image. This particular sputum uh, gram stain is one of my favorite of the gram stain images. Uh, the image is useful in a number of instructional settings. Um, it's an excellent example of the uh, lancet-shaped diplococci, typical of Streptococcus pneumoniae. One can clearly see the capsules against the mucus strands in the picture, and the numerous white blood cells show it to be an adequate uh, sputum sample. This is just one example of the many available images there, and they could all be used to support lecture and other um, PowerPoint presentations but I have found that they are also excellent uh, resources for student projects. An exercise that I've assigned for my pre-allied health class includes a microbe diary with my pet microbe. For the diary, they're told to write a paragraph each day on how they interact with microbes that day. Many of them report that they've eaten yogurt or cheese or they drink beer they often observe people in public places not covering a sneeze or not washing their hands appropriately. Some can be pretty creative in their observations. At the end of the week, they have to choose one organism that could have been involved in one of their interactions. They don't do any actual isolation or identification in the laboratory. They just choose an organism that is consistent with something that they observed. Um, they are encouraged to read a little bit about that particular organism and then write a short summary about it and how it could have been the one involved in their encounter. I encourage them to illustrate their reports. So the microbe library is an excellent resource for them. In other words, it's not just for instructors, but it's a valuable student resource too. I need to mention that the gallery has been translated into Spanish. And the ASM, or much of the gallery has been translated into Spanish, and the ASM's translator network can always use more volunteers. So if you have that expertise, 
step up and volunteer. So, the gallery images that we were just looking at each had just a short descriptive legend. In contrast, the visual media briefs all come with more of a story. Microbe Library accepts images, animations, and videos for both collections, but currently most of the animations and videos are in the visual media briefs. Um, on the primary pages, the thumbnails look very much like the gallery, and the images often would stand on their own in their usefulness in presentations, but you will notice a much longer inform information section. There may be several images associated with a visual media brief page, but not as many as with the gallery collections. In addition to some of the spectacular representations of common organisms and processes, you're more likely to find some of the odd and unusual findings here. Okay, so it really is just a cell infected with cytomegalovirus. It just looks like a space alien. Again, most of the animations and the videos can be found in the visual media briefs. Let's search for my favorite gram stain animation. There it is! <laughs> Remember that there's also a lot of information about the procedures on these pages, but let's go into the animation itself. It got big on me. Okay, there we could see it, I think. Um, so, this is an animated uh, presentation on the gram stain, and it's just my all-time favorite. We're going to start with the gram positives. So it's a, a diagram of the, of the uh, cell wall of a bacteria, and we're going to go very quickly through this, and I encourage you to come back and read the verbiage. It's excellent. It's very explanatory but um, the animations pretty much speak for themselves for a, an informed observer. So we're going to add the crystal violet to this gram-positive cell wall. And we'll observe it coming through the thick peptidoglycan layer, through the phospholipid bilayer, and um, collecting under the, under the cell membrane. Now we're going to apply the iodine. The iodine again is going to penetrate the membranes and it's going to find the crystal violet there. My favorite part, they just get bigger. The students love that piece. I think it's, it's very good that they can visualize that, the, that the, um, the molecule actually becomes larger. Here comes the decolorizer. It hits the peptidoglycan layer and shrinks it down. And then it prevents the um, release of crystal violet molecules, and then of course uh, we add the uh, counter stain, which does very little to change the color at this point. And then when we observe them under the microscope, they're of course a violet color. In contrast, the gram negatives, it's an excellent diagram and a, and a very good explanation down here of the lipopolysaccharide layer on the gram-negative organism in contrast of it with the gram-positive one and the thin peptidoglycan layer there. Again, we apply the crystal violet. It penetrates. We add the iodine. And again, like magic, they get bigger. Then we add the decolorizer. And in this one is very dramatic for the students. I, I think that this, um, uh, well, it's a dramatic illustration of how the lipopolysaccharide level layer is totally removed, physically removed from the cell. And then, of course, the peptidoglycan layer becomes uh, thin and brittle, and the crystal violet molecules are allowed to be released from the cell. So in this case, when we apply the counter stain, It's the only stain available, and of course, when it's visualized as red.
So again, that's a really quick peek at this animation, uh, but I found it to be the best ever explanation and illustration of the gram stain procedure. I've used it as an assignment for my medical laboratory science students before they perform gram stains in the laboratory, and I post it as a reference uh, for the pre-allied health and the medical students. I always get positive feedback from this assignment. It seems to be the, oh wow, now I get it, piece of the puzzle of learning how to do gram stains, or learning why gram stains work the way they do. There are many other animations and some videos. Um, among the animations, I would especially highlight Gary Kaiser's collection on immunology, um, there's, especially if you teach immunology. And there's more beautiful videos that we don't have time to show right now, but please go exploring. A large portion of the gallery section will make a lot more sense after we look at these protocols. Most of the images that are used to illustrate a protocol are also listed in the gallery section, but the gallery may, may also have an extended uh, collection of examples illustrating the use of the protocols that are not seen in the protocol itself. So if you're using one of the protocols, I also recommend that you go back to the gallery and look for additional references or additional illustrations of how the protocols can be used. Um, I'm going to use the blood auger plates and the hemolysis as an example of a protocol. Make this big again. Um, one thing that sets the protocols apart from a textbook or a lab manual is the history section. Since the ASM has a wonderful collection of primary literature, their archivists can help the authors gain access to some really interesting details on the evolution of these commonly used procedures. So if you're a bit of a history buff, or if you have students that are, um, many of these protocols are a good resource for their interest in history. As you move on down the page, you can see that the sections are pretty consistent throughout the protocols. There'll be a purpose, a theory of how the media is used, a recipe, a formulation for it, um, and then um, um, how, the, how the media itself is used in practice. Um, similar, similarly, the nitrate production, or reduction test um, is another example. Um, and you know, you might have excellent students who, who uh, understand this procedure right away. Uh, that's not mine. They always seem to struggle with uh, the nitrate procedure. And I think that inclusion of some real life um, illustrations of the chemistry is helpful for them. In this particular one, it shows that the detection of nitrites in uh, crime scene detection is indicative of gunshot residue. And the chemistry is the very same that we use in the laboratory to detect the, reduc or the reduction of nitrates to nitrites. So I think it gives them a little piece of interest on uh, the chemistry itself. Then the rest of the procedure, again, follows the, the purpose and the theory. There's chemistry there. So I think these are very, very instructive to the students and to the instructor. Um, I also use some of the illustrations from that, from the, some of the exact illustrations from that page in my examinations. So I assign that page as homework before we discuss nitrate reduction in the laboratory. And you can always tell who's read it because they're the ones that are going to get it right on the examination. So again, protocols are another of the resources that work for students as well as for the instructors. The newest collection in the microbe library is the stu student learning assessment database. The purpose is to provide well-constructed questions for immediate feedback during class or for use on exams. The team in charge of the database has been working really hard to educate all of us on the principles of Bloom's taxonomy towards this goal of good question formation. Please take a look at this part of the site. 
it will be a great way to start sharing your ideas with Microbe Library. There's a great PowerPoint on Bloom's Taxonomy in the instruction section. The, the PowerPoint comes from a presentation that was given by Samantha Elliott at the ASM Conference for Undergraduate Educators in 2012. If this is the first that you've heard of Bloom's Taxonomy, don't panic. It's just a guide to help you think about the level of knowledge that your questions are testing and then to what degree your students are engaging their minds when they answer them. There are examples under the instruction section. There are examples of both the lower level type questions and the higher level ones. And all of them have some explanatory language from the submitter as well as the correct answers, of course. This summer I learned a quick and clever way to use these questions in the, um, in the classroom. So even if you don't have an electronic response system in your institution or in your classroom, um, um, this is a way that you can use the questions. So each of the students are given a set of brightly colored cards, just card stock in bright colors. And each of them has them for the duration of the course. Um, and they match the colors on the options for the questions. So with a raise of hands, you can get a feel for how the class stands on the subject. So when you ask the question, that's the right answer. They hold it up high. No, that's not the right answer. Um, so you can get a feel for, their, for how they feel about it, and what's their, what their understanding is of the subject. It's also fun to then allow them a time to change their responses, to see if they'll eventually come to a consensus. Let the room be silent. Let them just look around. Uh, sometimes uh, the majority of students will win, and it's not the right answer, and other times they learn from watching the, the other students in the class. So allowing them to, to change their answers afterwards is a fun exercise, too. So uh, that's what's coming soon to Microbe Library and you have an opportunity to participate in its creation. A look at some of the other ASM uh, resources begins with the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education, or GEMBI. A great effort has been made to make it a premier journal for microbiology educators. It's completely free of charge and it's available online. It's an opportunity for you to publish your pedagogical resource, and it's a great place to find curriculum resources and classroom activities that are complete with assessment suge uh, suggestions. I believe that the heart of ASM's teaching resources is the annual conference for undergraduate educators. Many of the ideas that eventually um, are published in the Microbe Library and the GEMBI are born at this meeting. I know that some of you would have a very long ways to travel, but if you find the resources to come, if they become available to you, you will come away from this meeting so enthusiastic about your teaching and you'll be full of new ideas. www.microbeworld.org is an online magazine that you and your students might find interesting. The stories are cutting edge. The students love this stuff. Um, for some more in-depth perspectives, you might check out the ASM blog, Small Things Considered, and spend some time exploring the ASM's website. The Education Division, Division W, um, has a page with a lot of good resources. You'll notice again that the curriculum guidelines are there also. Um, many more resources, including many of the ones that we've just talked about. There's some more um, resources on the ASM um, homepage for education, which is the Education Board. So, thank you for your attention. I wish that I were live and able to take your questions, but I hope to see you at the next conference for undergraduate educators and we can talk about it then. Again, thank you for your attention.